Good evening, everyone. Happy summer. I'm gonna, still summer, we're still, and we're gonna have this evening, you're gonna have some summer evening time, I swear, I'm sure. Um, I'm gonna call this meeting to order at 7, 10 p.m., the meeting of the Finance Committee, which will be followed by our working board meeting. And um, let's see, what's the first thing on our agenda? I will do, you wanna do a roll call? Here. Here. Ms. Chow. Here. Um, we first have an action, we have two action items, and then we'll go into our discussion, uh, prim focused on primarily two items, which is the discussion of the tentative budget and um, a discussion item that we held over from our last meeting on outstanding lunch fees and unpaid meals. So, but first to do our action items, the first action item is minutes. Um, the Finance Committee recommends that the minutes of the June 5th, 2017 Board Finance Committee meeting be approved as presented. Second. Ms. Boyd? Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Chow? Yes. Motion passes. And then our second action item, um, which I'll read, I'll read the motion and then perhaps Raphael or some, at least explain to the um, to the folks here what we are acting on. <laughs> um, it's a required yeah. action. Sir, can I do one quick thing before we do this? Sure. May I introduce formally to the committee, oh my Raphael goodness. Obafami. Feels like you've been here right, forever. Right, right. I oh, and, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, and we'll do this again at the board meeting next week. But, it, um, but Raphael has joined us as the chief financial and operations officer. Um, and it feels like you've been here for years and that's fantastic. <laughs> and, addition to the uh, senior team and has been working hand in glove with Kathy and Kate and the rest of us as we move forward. I just want to do a formal uh, superintendent and finance committee welcome to Rafael. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Thank Gore. You. I was remiss, but I just felt, figured you must have been here at a different meeting. Yeah. So <laughs> apologies, everything moves together for me. Um, Thank you. Okay, so our first action item is the notice of appointment of our authorized agent with IMRF. Um, the Finance Committee recommends the appointment of Rafael Obaf is it Obafemi? Obafemi. 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 Obafemi as the District 65 IMRF authorized agent to be submitted to the full board for approval. Second. Do you want to say anything no, really. about this no. esteemed appointment, Rafael? <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. Okay. So. All right. I'll take a look. Ms. Klein? Yes. 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 yes, and we are very grateful to have Raphael here and um, leading us forward through what's going to be a great financial year, I am sure. Um, <laughs> our first item of discussion before we get to the tentative budget, as I've said before, Kate Mason Schultz is here, our nutrition services manager, and Kathy um, to discuss our procedure and policies around outstanding lunch fees. And we had a memo, again, in the June meeting and included as well in this packet. Um, so I'll let Kate start off and just kind of explain what you would like to explain about the memo in reference to the procedure. I know we're required to have a procedure place, but just as by way of background, um, there were, and you can add Paul, um, this past year, there were a number of students or a number of families where we had um, overdue balances and there was an effort among the community, across the community, um, a great, a kind of amazing effort to um, raise money to basically remove, um, remove those balances so that there was no uh, unpaid balances for, for students and families. And while that was underway, it also raised a uh, discussion uh, about how can we do a better job in terms of our process, our procedure, uh, our communication around um, low balances so that students aren't getting in the middle of that dialogue and, um, and so that there's more transparent information and also raise some issues around um, just what meals are provided, et cetera. So I think we had a really healthy discussion with members of the PTA Council in the spring and that raised, and Kate and um, 
Kate and Mary were there. Mm -hmm. uh, that raised some issues, and then we also, there was also a requirement in place to do a new procedure in terms of actually notifying and communicating what our procedure is. So create an opportunity for us to look at this kind of what we're doing and see if we can improve. So, so if I may, just a couple uh, framing uh, contextual issues that go along Candace with what you uh, provided. Um, we think it's important for kids to have healthy meals uh, when they start the day um, and, and at school. Um, this is the meal program is a meal program that's a federally um, authorized with federal guidelines meal program. It's one of the great programs of the Great Society to make sure that we can provide free and reduced lunch services for our children, especially our children in need. Um, when when we uh, implement this, we follow very specific federal guidelines. And, um, and so we provide, depending on an income level of the family, uh, a free lunch, and that's free, and so there's no, there, there's no uh, real issue with, with those children who are happy and, and indeed honored to serve. For the reduced lunch, we do provide lunches, um, but at a reduced rate. And so those families do have to pay according to the federal guidelines. Um, and that we have to implement. And then there's all the reimbursement guidelines that we have um, that, are, that are engaged in that. Um, and so I say that just to say that as we move forward in the conversation, we provide information. Uh, the, you know, the goal is to provide meals for all children. Um, the free lunches come um, uh, to the children, the reduced lunches come, but it's in that zone where we run into balances that we've run into. Um, and um, and we want to discuss that, and yet we want to be careful to remember what the board has pushed the administration over the last several years around fees, because we've, uh, uh, we've done, and Kathy has led a very um, important and, um, and robust push to collect our fees given financial constraints that we have. So there are costs, and the costs for the program are approximately, uh, including what we get from the federal government, we pay about $35,000 or $36,000 annually before we cover, if we have to cover any of the extra fees. Right. So, it varies from year to year, but last year there was a small deficit, there, ran a deficit. Right, so we ran a deficit of $36,000. So, so that just sets some context for what Kate's going to provide um, uh, as information as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so the memo um, that was provided I wrote towards the end of the school year last year. Um, so I'd like to walk you through it, um, not word for word, hopefully, um, but walk you through and hopefully hit some of the points that Candace mentioned as well. Um, so over the course of last school year, our unpaid meal procedures were a topic of discussion. Our current procedure, and um, this procedure has been in place at least for the last 18 years, um, I was told, um, is that students who do not have enough money for a meal will be loaned um, the amount that is short for a maximum of two meals um, and given a loan lunch. Uh, the amount of money loaned will be charged to the student's meal payment account after these two loan lunches, students will be offered a complimentary meal, which um, right now entails a soy butter and jelly sandwich and milk. And also, um, within the last five years, we started including the option to um, choose fruits and veggies as well. Um, there is no charge for this food. Um, if the loan is not repaid and the student continues to return to the cafeteria with no money or a packed lunch, school personnel will attempt to contact the child's parent or guardian. Um, it is also advised that the Nutrition Services Department is not required by state or federal law or by board policy at this time to provide a meal at no charge to students. Um, this procedure has assisted in two key points. One, um, keeping negative balances at a minimum. Uh, negative six dollars for elementary students and negative 650 for middle schoolers. An additional um, benefit is that students are always offered a meal. Um, they are not turned away without food. As of the end of April 2017, 
District 65 had a total of 2,941 students who qualified for free lunch, 289 students who qualified for reduced lunches, and 4,868 full paying students. There is an attachment to the memo that breaks this down by site as well. Um, school year 16-17, we provided approximately 5,498 complimentary meals to full pay and reduced eligible students who had run out of funds. Um, if we wanted to illustrate the cost of this, um, kind of a median number is uh, 70 cents. So the cost to our department for providing these complimentary meals was $3,000. $848.60. It should also be noted that complimentary meals cannot be claimed for state or federal reimbursement. Um, to go in a little bit further to the procedure itself, when a student's account begins to get low, our lead servers will give an initial verbal reminder to the student that they will need more money soon. Um, Depending on the server, they may attempt to contact the parents or guardians directly if they feel comfortable doing so. They may also go to the school principal. Some schools still choose to send home paper um, negative balance letters, um, but it has really been school by school that they've decided how to handle this. Um, it has never been part of the lead server's job requirements to call or contact families regarding low balances. Those that have done it um, have done so on their own accord, and um, I thought that should be noted. Uh, if you look at the table on the second page, there's information regarding the current negative balances as well as the number of complimentary meals served by school. Um, we don't use negative balance reports alone simply because the negative balances carry on throughout the child's career in our district. So if a kindergartner comes in one day, doesn't have money in their lunch account, but chooses to purchase a milk for 60 cents, that account can sit at negative 60 cents until they finish eighth grade. So in order to really understand a student's account, you have to go in and research each account, student by student. Um, also on this table, you may notice that reduced students did not carry any negative balances. Candace mentioned our um, generous donation that was um, made by many members of our community. Uh, and the woman who spearheaded this fundraiser, she was very clear in that she wanted this money to be spent on our reduced eligible students. Um, so we allocated some of those funds and made lunches available for the reduced students for the remainder of the year. We received those funds, I believe, the end of March, beginning of April. Um, the best way to combat negative balances is to ensure that families receive information regarding the free and reduced meal application. Uh, so far this summer, this application information has been made available um, through a variety of platforms. There's a current banner on the district homepage. Information has been sent to community centers through the city of Evanston, as well as the public library and community churches. It will also be mentioned in the FAST 5, um, either this week or next, and it will be mentioned on our social media accounts. It was made available at district information nights back in March, as well as um, open houses at each school. Additionally, a district-wide email was sent out to all families who are not directly certified um, for our lunch program via email, and that took place the last week in July. Um, Candace mentioned we had a PTA meeting May, I don't know when, May, I think. It was May. Um, there were some ideas that were brought up at that meeting in order to further assist families in the application completion. Um, one of those ideas was to set up a guest laptop at each school so that families uh, can utilize that space in their child's school. 
they may feel more comfortable doing that there. Um, this is something that I'm working on still with Joe Caravello, um, but I do know that some schools, or I've been told that some schools already do this. Um, providing principals with negative balance and complimentary meal reports is something that we can do um, as long as those reports are being utilized for their intended purpose in helping to um, collect negative balances and, and keep student accounts funded. Emailing negative balance letters. This is also something that I found out that we can do, um, which I think will be very advantageous for us. Uh, we're working on the logistics right now as far as how often, at what point, who's going to be doing it, um, all of those things, but it is possible and um, I'm very much hoping that we can employ that this year. Um, another idea was CEP, which is the Community Eligibility Provision. Uh, this is done through the state. It's a different way of claiming meals. Um, it allows families to not have to fill out meal applications. Um, and everybody, all the students at either the entire district or specific schools eat for free. Um, and then we are allowed to claim those meals differently. Right now, um, our numbers don't warrant that. It's not something that's recommended by the state until your free and reduced, mom free and reduced rates are at least 70%. Um, I think our highest is 55. Is so, it 70% at the district and 70% at the school? Well, 70% they recommend district-wide. I looked at our three, um, our three sites with highest percentages. I think the highest one was 55 or 57%. Mm -hmm. I do I have more in, details on if that. If I can it's, jump in, what uh, Kate is talking about is the break-even point. You have to hit the break-even point of 70% in you know, order not to lose money on the program. Mm -hmm. If you don't get to that break-even point of 70%, if you offer it to everyone, you wouldn't get enough reimbursement from the federal government to make up the difference. So in essence, when we subsidize the program, that would be losing money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we made it available to everyone. It means we couldn't charge the people that aren't free reduced lunch forever. Right. Okay. Correct. Right. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so, what now, and keeping in mind I wrote this at the end of May, uh, ISBE is requiring that every school district create an unpaid meal procedure, um, which we already have or had. Um, this procedure must be communicated to all families and staff prior to the start of the school year. This is something new and to my knowledge has not been done ever in the past. Um, so that we are planning on doing. I also have made mention of um, the unpaid meal procedure on our menus in our parent student handbook. It has its own tab on the nutrition services homepage. Um, the, there's an attachment with the memo also, kind of a draft memo that will be going out to families next week along with my school box information. Um, so every family district wide will get that. Uh, I will be addressing and going over this, pol or this procedure with our staff uh, on the 25th, and then it will also be sent to principals and secretaries as well. Basically, anybody that needs to know, it will be going to. Um, um, nutrition services has been asked, and I, I think over the years, not just in this past year, but um, we've been asked if we have to provide complimentary meals or if it's possible to provide regular lunches instead. Um, so there are lots of questions to consider. Um, specifically, what happens as far as claiming these meals? In order for our meals to be claimed for reimbursement, they need to be entered in our POS system as the student goes through the lunch line. Um, if we were to provide a, re a regular lunch in lieu of the complimentary one, the, the student's account will continue to go further negative. 
Um, and we would have to ask ourselves at what point would there be a limit. Um, if there is one thing that I did learn over the course of many conferences over the summer is that it's highly advisable to have a limit, a, a charge limit. Right now ours is two meals. Um, there were, and there still are many districts in the state of Illinois that number one didn't have a procedure set in place and didn't have or don't have uh, meal credit limits and they're in pretty considerable um, financial situations as far as tens of dollars in bad debt. Um, so that was one thing that was definitely recommended to be part of our procedures. Um, if students are given a regular lunch, regardless of their account balance, when would we expect payment? Um, and what would happen to negative balances? So in order for us to claim meals, meals have to be entered in our POS. There's not a way to, to bypass that or override that. Um, and then on this last page, there is a table on the bottom. What I did was I took the amount of complimentary meals that we served over school year 16-17 and hypothetically turned them into regular meals. So in this first column you can see the meal cost, which is what we pay ETHS per meal um, of $1.75. You have to take into account that there's no student payment coming in. So if a, student's, if a student is receiving a, a, a complimentary lunch, it's because they've already reached their maximum negative of those two lunches. So we wouldn't be expecting payment at that point. Um, we would be able to get federal reimbursement, um, but if you look at the cost, after doing all of this math, um, the cost to the district would be $18,379 instead of what we did pay, um, $3,848. That's my memo. <laughs> I know there's questions, so. Sure. Um, let's start with questions. Hi, Kate. So um, thank you so much for putting this all together. And I know we exchanged some emails about this today. Sure. Um, about trying to get to understand the, the table that you just enunciated a bit more and what the actual cost would be to the district from a cash sure. basis um, uh, if we were to offer students the, the regular lunches as opposed to the little complimentary. Yeah, mm -hmm. the complimentary lunch. Mm -hmm. um, but before I get there, I just want to quickly say how sad this conversation makes me. Um, I feel like there are two very distinct groups of students that we're probably talking about in this balance situation. And it sounds like one group is being dealt with pretty, pretty well, and I'm concerned really about the second group um, that I worry is being left behind. And I know that the reduced lunch qualification is pretty, it's a pretty tight band of income for a family and doesn't take into account a lot of factors. And I'm concerned that there's a lot of families that are right at that margin that don't quite call, qualify for reduced lunch mm -hmm. and can't afford to pay their balances. So every time they get a notice coming back in their kid's backpack, mm -hmm. that's causing them a lot of distress versus the other families who just forgot to put money in their kid's account. And I want to make sure that we have a policy in place that works for all of those students. Um, I think that leads us to talking about the real cash impact of mm -hmm. offering a, the same lunch to kids, whether or not they have the money in their account to pay for it. Because I think we all understand and appreciate that it's a significant social emotional hit for kids to be offered the lunch under the counter versus the lunch that everyone else is getting. Um, so that's why I'm obsessing a bit over this, uh, this dollar figure. Um, but regardless, in the context of our overall budget, even if the actual cost were $18,000, that's not a significant hit to our overall operating budget, right? Just to put it in context, right? When we're talking about $18,000. $18,000 to the To our overall budget. If the actual cost of offering 
the, tr the, the same meal to all kids. I think, I think you had, the thing you would have to look at is if we're running at a $36,000 deficit Already. on meal provision, and you add 18,000 to that, it effectively is, you know, a 50, it's a 50% increase to a, the deficit program. Yes, in, in a 120 some million dollar budget, it is not significant, but um, there is, there's, you know, multiple ways of looking at it because if we are running a deficit, do we want to increase that deficit by 50% would be the question. Okay. Um, That's right. Not ignoring that, yes, we would want to give the same meals, but that, when I look at it that way, the order of magnitude becomes a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. I guess and that's, there's a lot of things we could probably do to decrease the deficit, but not a lot. There's one thing we could do to decrease that deficit, which is be to raise the price of every meal of, for people who don't qualify for free and reduced lunch, right? If all, our lunches were three fifty dollars instead of $3. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we were in a situation where we had to increase revenue coming in just for the lunch program, yeah. and for whatever reason we were deciding to look at the lunch program as one siloed budget, mm -hmm. um, the, that, that would be one level that we'd have. Two things we have to consider in place that the uh, National School Lunch Program, they have something called pay lunch equity, which kind of sets the, the parameters of how much you can charge for paid lunch. That's, that's number one. The other thing you have to worry about, you have to worry about electricity, if you will. How much do you charge the folks who are paying the full price and how high can you raise it to the point where fewer and fewer of them are buying lunch? And what we are hoping to accomplish then becomes the opposite. Sure, that makes sense. Um, I understand that. So I guess let me get back to my original question, which is around the, um, the model, if you will. Um, and I, I guess the first question that I have is if we're talking about what we're really trying to get at uh, is what the incremental cost would be to the district of offering the same lunch. So the cost of the comp lunch, should, it, it doesn't look like it's showing up in the table or being subtracted out of the incremental cost. Um, Sorry, that's... The... You're referring to this last table. I'm sorry. On this last table on the fourth page. Yes. Um, no, I wouldn't have taken out the price of the complimentary lunch. All I was doing, in essence, was creating a comparison of. So the total cost would be the eighteen thousand, but we were already paying thirty-eight hundred dollars. So really, the increased. The increased cost would be? No. Actually, this would be if we were to serve the regular meal in lieu of the complimentary meal. So every time we served a complimentary meal this year, right. if we would have served the regular lunch right. instead, right. And the it, regular would lunch cost, a, sorry. it would have been at a cost of 18000 So I think the, the real difference here versus, is that we, get no, we would get no reimbursement right. for that regular lunch is what I'm hearing. Because if we got the re reimbursement for the regular lunch that we typically get, that's where I think the difference is only $800 because then the net are... Not yet. No? Well, so I'm saying that right now, the base cost of a meal for the comp lunch is on average, you said, 70 cents. 70 cents. Mm -hmm. And our cost to ETHS of our regular meals is $1.75. Okay. So if we are choosing to go with a regular meal instead of the comp lunch, it's not like we're going from zero to a dollar and se to a dollar seventy five. No. We're going from One. seventy cents to a dollar seventy five. So really, mm -hmm. the cost of the meal, the incremental cost of the meal, is ninety five cents. Ninety five cents. Dollar five. Dollar five. Dollar five. five. Really right. So it'd be a dollar five times right. however many of these. Right. right. So mm -hmm. then that's regardless of the reimbursement. Then the reimbursement issue. I guess the question that I had to you earlier today was I wasn't sure why we were factoring in the consumer cost uh, into our cost as well. If we're not sure. getting that money, that's just not money, money that we're not getting, we're not paying out $3, but you had mentioned something about. So I think I'm understanding what you're asking, hopefully. So 
the cost of the meal, $1.75, is what we pay ETHS. Every lunch that we order from every elementary school, we're charged $1.75, school year 16, 17. That is an invoice that Nutrition Services pays to them monthly. The $3 and the 40 cents still has to be paid by somebody in order to get any reimbursement for these meals. So what if we didn't get reimbursed for those meals? So if you didn't reimburse, you would be paying $1.75 per meal. Okay. So and that brings the cost down significantly. If so effectively, if I'm doing the math right here, we're talking about $1.05, the difference, so the extra cost if we were to give a regular lunch based on last year's number, would be $1.05 times 5,498 meals, right? Which is $5,498 effectively. So, so the difference would be 5,500, roughly $5,500. Right. Assuming that we still do the same number of complimentary meals, um, there's a signal associated with the alternative meal that I think we have to, there, the, there's process issues here that I actually think are more, are, are as big or bigger than the food issues. <laughs> that those are, but you know, $5,500 isn't a huge amount of money. It's not, it's not third, whatever we were just saying before. So incrementally, 55, we would, to make a shift to giving students the same, same lunch meal, not have a stigma attached with an alternative meal, we would be accepting $5,500. Is that, does everybody, that makes sense? Yes. So I think the question, and we're not going to vote or answer this question today, is, is would, number one, would that be a good decision to make for $5,500 to provide just the same versus our alternate meals, um, assuming all else is equal? So that's one question. That's not a decision of the board, I don't think, but it is something to consider given some of the feedback that we've gotten about, you know, those alternative meals and the stigma attached to receiving those alternative meals that not withstanding the food itself, right? Mm -hmm. So is it worth $5,500? Maybe it is. You know, that's very different to me than, than um, $18,000, right? So I think that's something that we would ask it, um, you all to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'd like any other opinions of, you know, other, other board members of what, whether they think that additional incremental costs would be, would be valuable, if they have anybody that has input on that. So um, I, I would agree that that uh, changes it from 50% of the cost to about one seventh, um, actually less than that, of the, the current budget. So I think that that's, um, not an unreasonable cost to build in, given the social and emotional consequences of, of not. Um, I would just say my, I think I equally am empathizing with the emotional experience that um, children have had, and you know that's the constant balance of this level of work is that we have to think very concretely about large scale policy, but also <clears throat> be incorporating empathy and um, and direct experiences in that decision making as well. Um, I personally was a child that lived in a home where we could not always cover our lunch fee and it was embarrassing. Um, and there were lots of different processes that were attempted but it felt like none of them were empathetic to the experience of me as a child. Um, because I had no control over how income, how, how income was dealt with or finances were dealt with in my family. And so I think that the larger issue is, um, when, I, when I think about this it, um, issue in our district, is ensuring that children are not bearing the weight of the conversation. And so not having, a, getting a complimentary lunch that should, that demonstrates to everyone the financial state of your family, I think is um, 
ensuring that children aren't carrying the weight of resolving these issues. But I also just am curious, are there other process, um, processes that are going to be built in? I know that it's um, an issue of job description, it sounds like, whether or not folks are going to call families directly. Um, but is there anywhere else within the system that that process can be built in so that children are not the couriers of information that's not within their, um, their responsibility. And so I think that that's probably the larger, in addition to, to this issue of visibility um, to other children and um, trying to pr protect children's privacy and dignity is um, ensuring also that they're not carrying unreasonable responsibility in the conversation. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with everything that you've said. I am hoping that the email of negative balance, um, negative balance statuses um, reports will very much help with the, the prevention of the complimentary meals. Um, I think as a department, this procedure has been in place for a long time and this having been my first complete year, I, f I, I do recognize the fact that we need to be retrained. Um, there needs to be more accuracy and more consistency. And I, I get that. Um, that is a high priority project for me. So um, I, I did wanna say, you know, we really brainstormed over the summer how we, how we can provide the complimentary meals a little more discreetly. Um, we talked about buying or purchasing um, lunch boxes, insulated lunch boxes that we can pre-pack lunches in uh, and then put in the, most of the classrooms have um, like laundry baskets that come down with the lunches packed from home. So being able to put those in discreetly um, prior to lunch periods is something that we've discussed. We don't know how we'll get the lunch bags back. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are, there are some, some things that we're discussing and how we can do that. Also, we do serve a munchable lunch. Um, it's bagel, cream cheese, cheese stick, yogurt. That is served in a plastic bag. Um, one of the ideas that I had was to put the complimentary sandwich in that bag, at least, so when the kids are coming through the line, it's not a quite so obvious difference in the delivery of the meal. They still go through the line. They can get milk, the fruit and veggie. You know, they still pick up the tray just like any other student does, um, but that sandwich would be handed to them and, you know, made to look like that munchable meal, an, an option or, you know, uh, an idea that we had. At the middle school level, um, my thought is that our managers need to run their negative balance report in the mornings before lunch starts um, and catch any students before they come through the line. Um, I know a lot of them, a lot of our cashiers do tell them, you know, the day prior, but um, lunch periods are rushed. Kids are rushed to eat and rushed to get through the lines. So um, it's, a, it's a difficult situation. So, but I do appreciate any ideas and feedback, so. I would just say also, I, I think emails may be difficult for some, for some people. Sure. Um, and yeah, that, that could be a barrier <coughs> for some folks as well. And so I really think that um, if there's any way for within process for someone to be responsible to know um, what form of communication has historically been more helpful, like um, this parent, if there's some kind of checklist or you know some record of this parent needs to be called, this parent needs to be emailed, um, just so that we're adapting to what different households um, need in terms of communication. 
so I think my comments and questions have to do around the process, but I did just want to respond. I do think that there still is a stigma, no matter how you bag it, tag it, make it pretty, they're sitting together. That you can make it dressed up and, and beautify it, they're still sitting next to each other. And if I see her with that lunch, I know. So I'm just, I love the idea. I think the other thing is that we don't know as teachers who, I don't know who's free and reduced. Right. I have no idea. And so I wouldn't know who, I don't necessarily know about balances. So I, you know, so that's another response that getting it into our lunch boxes before we get down there, we have no idea. We just put it in and so we um, wouldn't, so I'm wondering uh, around this contact thing, um, I really do think that kids, um, I really do think that we need to take the kids out of it, even at middle school. Mm -hmm. um, they're going through a lot at that middle school age. So to um, considering all that they're doing, they probably will forget by the time they get home. <laughs> um, I, I would like to see something a little bit more consistent across schools. I appreciate that different schools are different and they need to decide on their own. But I think a clear process sends, um, can help us all. Families go from school to school, we know, and, and that's um, a great thing um, sometimes, but then they might be expecting a different process mm -hmm. if you've got people who are doing things differently. Um, and so I'm gonna kind of echo Anya's idea. I wonder if there is a way to enlist the teacher's help, not that we are contacting, but to say, um, and I'm still not clear who's <coughs> contacting the family from this memo, because it said school personnel, mm -hmm. so I circled who is that, because mm -hmm. then you said later it's not the, so I'm just not clear. So I think whoever that personnel is, it needs to be consistent, mm -hmm. is my suggestion. And I do think that um, if you can talk to the teachers and say, hey, you know, Joey's family, I'm having trouble, you know, can you, what's the best way to contact them? We know the best way to contact them and we'd be happy to help along. It may be a checklist or something. I, I think that's not an unreasonable expectation to reach out and say, how do you contact this parent? We really want to help with this balance. Um, and the last thing, you talked about getting this information to people. I really would encourage you to give it to staff members, uh, teachers um, who are taking lunch every day so that we know this new procedure and process, because honestly, it's us who gets affected when the kid's coming back crying and hasn't eaten lunch or didn't get us, you know, what something happened, we, it, it's on us. So I think that, um, I'm, that please include teachers in those list of people. I know PTA usually puts out um, information packets to all families. If there's something that we can print out and put in those first day of school packets, I, you know, I mean, I know they get a lot, but I just think the better, if this is different than the better communication in addition to emails. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I do think we can get a little overwhelmed with emails too. Sure. So I like various options. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I think all options are better ways at trying to communicate instead of one or the other. I think those are my two uh, you know, I, I want to I want to echo what you just said again. It it it, it really is about providing fa information to families in every mode possible. Mm -hmm. Can we text them? Can we get them through Facebook? Do we get them? Through, I mean, I, <laughs> I mean, again, so 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 again, there, you know, there, there's a District 65, uh, you know, parents Facebook that we can communicate some of these policies in uh, that people frequent. I know there's a Twee one uh, for two-way emergent parents. Um, Phone calls. Um, I mean, I, I really, I, for me, it really is about uh, again trying to remove the children out of the equation and making sure that the adults are planning together uh, to ensure that 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 that, that there's no um, children are impacted social emotionally in a, in a negative way. So again, if we can get some consistency in regards to you know. Maybe that's a policy change. Maybe that's something that we need to talk in, 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 the, uh, in the policy committee. You know, should we have this um, uh, consistent policy throughout the schools where we have the school secretary, after she calls folks to, um, uh, about absences, then, you know, they, they get the list of kids who are, you know, have low balances and then calls those families, right? Mm -hmm. And it actually should be school-based, you know, and, and, and um, 
yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, that, that would be something that to, to I think, mm -hmm. talk about and, and further, further um, explore in regards to how we can ensure that there's that policy to ensure that there's a consistent, a consistent approach in how we communicate with families uh, right. around unpaid lunch uh, and not any other issues that, you know, mm -hmm. families are doing. I, I agree. It would be really um, helpful and I am sure much more effective for it to be school-based. Um, I, I think that if principals are on board with getting some of these reporting or even, um, you know, daily communication from our servers, um, that would be, you know, kind of our first step. And the good thing is that negative balances don't, we don't need to also communicate status. It really doesn't matter um, whether they're full paid or reduced. Right. So um, that uh, would help with the confidentiality there. I also wanted to, to so, so the concern came up about how, so, so again, kids bring in their lunch money, right? I mean, to, to, and they hand it in to teachers. How, how does, it, what's the process in the classroom? Uh, where, so, and, you know, you have parents who actually, you know, send their kids with money or they'll send money to, they'll bring it to the office. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. How is that, how, how, how is the, how is the money that's brought in, in put it into the, into the system, right? So the lead servers at each site, that's one of the first things that they do each day is to collect any money that's been um, brought in by students. Mm -hmm. We do have an automated prepayment system too with my yeah. school box. So school box, right. mm -hmm. a lot of families will use that, but we do still have a lot of cash and checks being brought in. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, well, I don't know if you want to Elaborate a little bit on that. Well, yeah, uh, well oh, go ahead. So, I'm just, I'm just so trying to one of the concerns the from, you know, so I had, had a parent who emailed me about. Um, <laughs> oh, um, I saw. oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that, mm -hmm. right? I it, saw. So, so again, the, so in regards to the accuracy of, of how that money's input uh, inputted into the system, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, is there any plans to kind of streamline how that's done or how, how to be more, more accurate? Sure. So. I did speak with Andrea, who is another supervisor in our department, um, and she remembered this case specifically. As far as the missing deposit, it never made it to the server, or it was very delayed from what she could remember. And without talking to the server, I don't really, I don't want to speak on her behalf. I don't remember the details. Yeah, I don't think we need to, to I don't think Sergio is asking for this particular issue. I think no, the, it's just the larger general. concern is in overall, general, which, you yeah. point, which you said in the beginning, Kate, and, and I guess just an acknowledgement that we've got some process training right. mm -hmm. issues happen, here, right. notwithstanding even the right. unpaid lunches that yeah. that we just need to, you all need to, to, to work on and just so that everybody is, um, you know, everything's accurately reflected in the system. Right. So yeah. I'd like to ask, like procedurally though, um, in terms of alignment across the organization, student discipline. A student racks up X number of office discipline referrals in a third grade year. Do they enter the fourth grade year with that baggage? Aside from the known factor that they've had the office discipline referrals, we expect them to get a clean slate as they start fourth grade. Mm -hmm. They come back after summer, a new person, grown, and they get a clean slate with a new teacher, a new team, and we expect even the specialist teachers who may have had that child to give them a clean slate that year. The, academically, they get a clean slate as they start a new classroom. Would there be an opportunity procedurally to give people a clean slate on their account when they start a new school year? Because I can just see a third grader or a seventh grader coming back year after year in that first week of school thinking they've got their new clothes on, they've started a good year, everything's a clean slate, and then they get in the lunch line. And they get that, they get that, that meal because they have the negative balance because we've racked it up potentially for nine years. Um, and would there be a way for us to procedurally at least give kids and families a fresh start each year because circumstances do change. And I can see a family who has a need, who's not able to make a payment when their child's in first grade, build up a balance. And maybe things change for them, but by the start of second grade, it's, it's amounted to be so much that they don't even want to try and make that payment. But maybe that we can level the playing field at the start of the year again so that maybe they can try and keep up during that second grade year. 
Um, and I don't know what that would cost. I don't know if it would lessen the impact at all, but there might be somebody who can find their way mm -hmm. to get on that ramp. Mm -hmm. um, well, I will say the maximum amount that they can be in the negative is $6.50 as a middle schooler, $6 as a elementary But they still get that other lunch when they've got that negative, right? If they're still at that negative. You're talking about an opportunity for them to get of back into the regular cycle. So, can I make a suggestion? Sure. I mean, the, the spirit of the conversation is rich and important and is spot on. We want our kids to have uh, uh, a nutritious lunch. We want them to not feel as though they're put into one bucket or the other bucket. We want to make sure that we're doing everything we can. It seems as though there's a couple procedural issues. There's some training issues. Mm -hmm. There's some staffing issues. The, the really quick comment, which is a good one, which is let's have the school secretary or the principal uh, do this. That's a staffing <laughs> issue and that's a time issue. And so we, I don't, I, and I don't know sitting here tonight what our, what the staffing ramifications would be or the impact on that. Um, and so, um, and then uh, what Kate said earlier, the, um, the, the guidelines of these sorts of programs where you need a governing policy and a, um, it's advisable to have a charge limit. Um, and that's something that we've been asked to do. So we have to pay attention to that as it relates to the resources that we're spending. I'm not, and, and again, in the, in the $120 million budget, this is inconsequential money per se, but not when it adds up and adds up and adds up. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we need to do as a team is to come back and say, given excellent feedback and given a, an intent to um, not place kids in different categories, what's most feasible, what's most feasible at, a, at whatever cost we can say is most feasible and what might cost us a little bit more and then are we willing to spend those resources? I think that's the, the larger conversation for the board for the finance committee. Well, I think there's, there's two things though that are, we're already saying are improvements here. So one is, we haven't been communicating Correct. consistently. So, there, so I think what you're hearing is a consistent form of communication already in the procedure that you put out here. You says, it says school personnel will attempt to contact the child's parents. So you're making a commitment in this procedure that is different than what I'm hearing has happened in the past. It's not us to say what school personnel, but is that, is that accurate that there's a commitment now that someone will be contacting parents, mm -hmm. either via email, phone, whatever the most, ideally the most appropriate for the family, mm -hmm. um, we are making a commitment to district to contact the families. Correct. That's not, if that's true, that's not something that we have done in the past. So that's already an advancement. And then it's, it's for, your, for you to think through who does that, how they do that, understanding the concerns here about you know, more consistent, the better, including the teachers in some way, because they may have information that's more relevant, relevant and informing the teachers. Um, so that's one piece, I think, at least implementing the email policy, again, has not been done in the past. Um, for many people, that will be an improvement. And, and then looking at, you know, for, as you said, yeah, the, sure. the alternative piece and what's the best way to mitigate that stigma. Cause it, I want to hear from everyone. The biggest issue we have here is consistency of communication, and we want to remove the student from the process yeah. um, and have it be an adult-to-adult -adult process. Can is I that just fair? ask one ask final financial question? Kathy, I know that you guys do a great job with your department about creating payment plans for families with other mm -hmm. fees. Are these fees in addition to those, or are they separate? And do families know that maybe I don't know, is this something that if a family did get up by fourth grade into a high negative balance that they can talk to the business? I mean, I'm just trying to think of, well, the magnitude is it's no more than $6. $6.50. So it's, ne it's never going to be beyond for middle schoolers. Mm -hmm. What about for elementary schoolers? Six. Oh, okay. So it's not going to okay. ratchet. And, and they are separate from the rest of the fees. They are okay. actually Thank you. Good service. So if we did the comp, if we did agree that we incorporating a um, cushion for giving folks regular meals as opposed to complimentary meals, um, then the other question would just be how parents are communicated with in a way that doesn't involve the child, right? And that's Maybe. consistent. Right? Yeah, and yeah. that is consistent and predictable. So I think as an FYI, if you guys can get you know, at some point. Come back. Come back. Right. That would be great. 
Can I okay. just ask one more really quick question about it? Sure. Thank you. Sorry. Um, the reduced lunch benchmark, that's a federal guideline, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Is there any mandate that our district has to follow that guideline explicitly? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. In order for us to get the reimbursement from the federal government, we have to follow the rules to the letter. But if we made the f reduced, if we offered more families reduced lunch and then just ate the cost of that, is that something that we could do? Yes. What we have to do, we have to actually physically write a check from another fund that is not part of the, uh, federal. the, the federal money and deposit it to the uh, nutritional account so it has to be wholly separate in order to be in compliance. Okay. I think this came up too at the PTA council meeting that step one was really improving application. I mean, the biggest hindrance here is requiring people to reapply every year, which is right. something that somewhere we should tell people mm -hmm. they shouldn't have to <laughs> call our state, wherever that's dictated. Um, mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. communication and getting as many enrollments as possible will mm -hmm. help that as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kate, and thank you for thank you. so much openness and energy around improving this process. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, we will move on to our tentative budget discussion. Kathy, are you going yes. to lead us through? Yes. Uh, so uh, in June, we had a presentation of the draft tentative budget. Tonight, we present the tentative budget for FY18. Um, what we'll do, we'll briefly talk about legal requirements for budget. Why do we need a budget? We'll uh, review, go back to FY17, because it is looking slightly different, what we uh, presented in June. We'll uh, review again assumptions for FY18 budget um, and uh, 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 joint agreement park school budget for FY18 as well. Um, our financial projections have changed slightly. We'll, go, we'll walk through that um, and we'll talk about budget uncertainties. So why do we have to have a budget? All uh, public, I know, unlike the state we live in, um, all public school districts uh, in, uh, in, in, in Illinois, by law, have to have a balanced budget. Have to have a, that's ideal. But budget approved um, by the end of the first quarter, uh, by September 30th. We will be adopting our budget on September 25th. The budget will be placed um, on display. Um, and we will file the budget with the county and with the state within 30 days. So how did we do last year? If you remember last, in, in, in June, when we were projecting our FY17, um, financial situation hasn't changed much, but it, it didn't really look good at all. I mean, they only paid us 50%. We were actually projecting over $2 million deficit. That luckily didn't happen. We managed, with turmoil happening and ongoing in Springfield, we managed to collect 99% of the revenues, and we spent 99% of our expenditures. Um, so we, we, our surplus, our budgeted surplus was $73,000. We actually managed to um, end with a 900,000 surplus because we got this additional payment, which is almost close to uh, $2 million, literally on the last day of the fiscal year. We will be using part of that surplus to make adjustments related to Park School. They were also affected in a negative way. Uh, and we will be diverting some of that surplus to our fund balance. As you remember, we are way below required fund balance of 25 to 40%. We are about 20%. That will help us um, to stay there. We're not going to go any higher, and hopefully we will avoid a downgrade uh, from uh, the bond rating agency. And the fund balance will come to later on when we talk about uncertainties um, as we face state uncertainties. Correct. So this uh, bar chart just illustrates um, uh, last year's budget, blue bar, and actuals. And you can s spot easily two variances. So on the left, we have a negative var variance of about 800,000 in our state revenues. We were not paid. Luckily, we received additional property taxes and uh, due to our efficiencies, Medicaid funds. So that helped um, to close that that um, um, variance on the revenue side. 
with the expenditure, that's the uh, a blue budget and um, uh, red actual um, bar on the right side with expenditures, we actually had a positive variance because we were able to achieve efficiencies with our employee group during negotiations in, in FY17, as well as some administrative uh, efficiencies and uh, reductions. Uh, moving to FY18, um, this is our 16th uh, consecutive balance budget. Um, we are projecting revenues, our revenues will be exceeding our budget by 14.7 million. Why? Because we will be getting uh, referendum revenue, revenues in, in the fall, which will um, help us to basically maintain our education model, but also do some additional things. We'll be able to um, 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 pay for some things that were previously paid as our board uh, some of our board members mentioned with a, with a credit card, uh, technology, instructional technology. We'll be able to do um, some uh, small capital projects, um, restore our fund balance, uh, as well as uh, add instructional uh, reading specialists. So referendum funds will help us to do all that. Um, as a result, revenues are going, as a result of the referendum, revenues are increasing by 23%. And um, we, um, oops, going back. And I just want to mention, especially to the new board members, that we, in addition to property taxes, I know we've been talking a lot about property taxes, we also have other local revenues included in our budget. Um, we have state revenues, federal revenues, and transfers. And this pie chart represents all of those sources. And you can see, just looking at that blue uh, uh, piece of, the, of, the, of this pie chart, that we rely heavily, as all of our neighbors, neighboring school districts, on property taxes. And uh, actually, after the referendum, uh, this um, um, uh, percentage of uh, went up. It's 78 percent in fiscal year 18. But we also um, we also get 9 percent from the state. So we are one of those hybrid districts that not only uh, get a lot in property taxes but also rely on the state. So if anything happens with the state revenues, we will be affected. Um, and um, actually, let me go back for a second to this slide. Um, so the referendum funds are included in the, in the property tax piece of the revenues. Uh, but we also, there is also the existing base of the property tax, and that piece is actually increasing only by, by 0.7 percent. And if you look at that slide, which represents a history of the CPI consumer price index, you can see that um, the, the CPI has been uh, very low very low, and there has been a downward trend uh, basically since 2011. And we feel the effect of CPI um, you know, a few years behind. That's why I, I added this, this yellow information, uh, because calendar years don't really um, correlate with our fiscal years. It's behind. We are feeling now, we'll be feeling the, the CPI from 2015, right? We're in 2018. but. Unfortunately, you know, when we filed the levy, it's, it's the prior year, year's information. Um, the bar in the, in the red on the far right represents our projected CPI. That's what we're using in our projections, which has been an average approximately. Uh, we used to use 2.5, then 2%, and now we're down to 1.5. Um, CPI as of June of 2017 is 1.6%. It's bouncing around. It was over 2% right after the federal elections last year. It's going down with all the uncertainties uh, nationally. Um, and, and, you know, again, uncertainties with the economy. We, we can't control that. So we use 1.5 as a, as, a, as a placeholder. Um, and as you saw from Kathy's chart, it goes up and down. And we actually calculate this average periodically to see, you know, if it's going down or up, and, and that's how we adjust our assumptions for projections. That's why these assumptions change quite a bit. Um, so this bar chart uh, compares um, fiscal year uh, 17 uh, blue bars um, uh, revenues by category with our budget. And you can see where that referendum money is going uh, in to which category 
um, uh, there are also, uh, you know, our budget report includes all those details line, but if you just want to quickly zoom in, where's the money going? That's where it's going, and that's, and, and the reason why it's so high next year, that 23%, is the way the county clerk pays out the increase. We will be getting 1.5% of the referendum increase, and then 14.5 million in the subsequent years. So basically, all the money is going to come in in the fall. You mean one and a half times? At one and a half times. Mm -hmm. So expenditures are increasing uh, by 11 percent, and I'm sure some of you, or maybe most of you, um, look at the number and said, "Wow, what's happening? Are they going a spending spree?" Well, we are not. This is a one-time adjustment. Uh, this number is going up primarily because of the three things. Uh, staffing costs. So what's built in the FY18 budget are the items negotiated, some of the new staffing costs negotiated with the FY17 uh, teacher contract, uh, additional staffing for planning, uh, for planning time, as well as some new uh, positions added due to um, uh, student needs. We also putting back on our books expenditures that always existed, but they were prepaid with FY16 surplus. If you remember, that's something that we use constantly. I mean, we, it, it was a difficult task to have a balanced budget. So if we had any surplus, we used that money to prepay something. But then you, you, what we deal with is a very uneven, uneven um, budget, basically. So all of these things, like the workers' comp um, insurance premium, liability, building liability insurance, all of those things are going back on the books. It's over a million dollars. Then we also have the items funded with, uh, with uh, referendum funding. And some of these expenditures existed in the past, but they were included, they were sitting in the non-operating budget, like technology, right. 1.9 million of technology. There's additional 875 for the iPads, for the middle school technology, uh, and other things that we mentioned uh, before. So all of this is being um, added to the budget. But if you look in the projections, the expenditures, the growth, the growth in, in the expenditures is, is going down. And then, of course, the cost of special education tuition uh, is, is increasing every year. And these are the positions that I mentioned that um, um, are being added to the FY, we're added to the FY18 budget, um, and uh, what's also included in the in the budget is the pension cost shift. Now this is an unknown. We realize that, and if if that legislation does not pass, it will be taken out. It will remain in the in the projection, especially that we don't put any other threats. Uh, but this is a one a placeholder that we have, and again, it will be taken out if it does not pass. And yet we're still in this funny state where we don't know whether the mandatory veto of the governors is going to pass. We don't know exactly what the impact is going to be on our budget, and so th this helps us against that if, mm -hmm. if there's some sort of impact in District 65. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So this pie chart just, again, illustrates um, our expenditures by category, and you can see clearly just looking at the blue and the yellow, this is the cost of our staffing benefits and salaries. 80% uh, of our all budget is uh, people, basically. Uh, this chart uh, compares FY17 actuals and uh, FY18 budget. It kind of shows you where these three things are that I just mentioned. The, the new salaries are in, included in the salaries. Then you have in purchase services, you have all these things that are going back to FY18 budget. And then uh, uh, technology, instructional technology and capital uh, improvement items. That's what's driving that cost up. Next slide, you saw it at the June presentation. These are the efficiencies uh, and budget reductions that were applied to FY18 budget. They will continue in the future. Actually, we have some really good news with, with Medicaid funding. We, we actually received a lot more than 200,000. We are hoping to, to get that momentum going. And, uh, um, and, base, and, and, and with our efficiencies, keep receiving additional funding. Although there could be something done at the federal level, again, another thing outside of our control. If that passes, then that unfortunately this will go away. We had a very, and led by Joyce and her team, 
we had a, and with Kathy's help and an outside consultant, Carrie Stewart, who you've met, we had a very intentional process to move forward on our Medicaid reimbursement and it yielded extra resources and we want to do our best to keep going. In, Absolutely. In that way. Absolutely, especially that we were also allowed to go back 18 months and recoup some of that uh, revenue from the past. I'm not going to read this slide, don't worry, but this is uh, basically a summary of our resolution that was uh, passed by our board unanimously on April 24, 2017, that basically controls and uh, restricts the spending of the referendum funds. So we just wanted to show our community that we care, that we take the yes vote very in response. This is an important um, uh, responsibility and uh, we're going to be watching the referendum reserves and, and uh, we have to, whatever it takes, we have to get through at least fiscal year 25 uh, and, and even, um, even further if we, if we can, but at and, least through FY. And you will 25. see in, the in a slide or two uh, coming up how the resources that we're receiving now for the referendum will actually help us in the out years. And so again, as Kathy says, this is a, um, a very strong commitment by this board of education to stay, stay the course on uh, preserving, reserving the referendum resources. Mm -hmm. And starting with this fall, we, we will be updating you uh, either quarterly, monthly, whatever committee decides on the balance on the reserves. So we all know what, you know, what we have and, 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 and how the money is being spent. Um, this budget just shows our expenditures by functions, and you can see that over 70% are services to students. It's all for students. I mean, we are here because of the students, but 71% with 51% going to instruction is spent on direct uh, uh, services to students. Uh, we, uh, we also adapting a separate budget, presenting a separate budget for Park School. Uh, even though it's one of our schools, it's a separate district to this day. They have their own budget, and we actually share the cost with, uh, with District 202. We educate 69 students, of, uh, of, of whom 12 are uh, paying out of district students. And as I said, we share the cost with the high school. We pay 1.4 million, we pay 60%, the high school pays. 40% of the cost, which is not covered by the tuition cost uh, revenues or any other revenues. So that brings us to financial projection page, which uh, looks slightly uh, different. The green column represents the tentative budget. And I just want to point your attention to line three, four, and five. Um, you do see that, that large excess of um, um, revenues over expenditures. Um, then there's this uh, payment uh, uh, towards our fund balance, this one million. But then there's this 13.5 million that's gonna be going to the reserves, referendum reserves. And that's the amount that we will be tracking going forward. Um, we leave a small surplus, 161 thousand because every year there are adjustments related to park school so we have to have this low cushion but we try we will try to save as much as possible and again so we can get to FY 25 and stay deficit uh, free um, this slide just shows again just a, 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 a projection of that uh, referendum reserves balance um, and I added I mean, I divided into two sections, saving phase and spending phase, and that's exactly what's gonna happen. We're gonna be saving money through fiscal year 25 and then using it um, so we can manage to get to FY 25. We do start using, it's important to point out that we do start using referendum funding almost immediately in FY 18, and that amount is uh, close to 8.3. Uh, million um, and again with 22 taken in this year so almost half of this money is being used immediately so it's not like we I mean we, we, we miscalculate no the money is needed and and it comes at the right moment so even if something does happen with the state we do have reserves to carry us um, to next year and I think that's 
the important thing is this was on Raphael's first day on the job. Raphael, Kathy, and I met and talked about efficiencies, talked about where we can look as we move forward. So we have these projections in front of us. We have the resources that were generously approved by uh, the community members. But where do we look to find cost efficiencies and some reductions as we move forward so we can stretch these resources out as long as we can? Right. And one of those tools that we will be using to help us do it exactly that is priority-based budgeting. We actually will be partnering uh, with Kerry Stewart again and doing a robust review of the budget expenditures, um, aligning them with our spending priorities, with our strategic planning, hoping to, to change how some of our money is allocated so we can not only uh, fund those priorities, but also find efficiency so we can, we can reduce uh, strategic deficit. Because even with the referendum money, you know, the, 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 strategic, the um, structural, structural, I'm sorry, structural deficit is still there. And, and uh, so we will be taking um, active steps to um, reduce it. And again, this is another visual uh, chart just to show our fund balance. Uh, we, which is going to look very good, going up to 39% for a few years. Um, yeah, I can see my time is up. <laughs> but, <laughs> but then, unfortunately, going down. So again, we are hoping that this, this new tool, a priority-based budgeting, will help us to keep that fund balance above that red line. That red line represents 25%. Uh, we have to go above that 25%, because we are, our, our, our bond rating will suffer. And, and unfortunately, you can't do it. You can't do it in the year when this, this, this rating is going down. It's too late. We have to take steps right now to build these efficiencies. And unfortunately, we do have a lot of budget, other budget uh, efficiencies. Uh, they're always the same, the CPI factor, the unknown cost of staffing beyond 20, uh, fiscal year 20, and, and of course, the state. Um, and again, the, the top line, the, the pension cost shift is in the numbers, but the bottom is not. Um, um, actually, the, the, the Senate Bill 484 died in the committee, but I'm sure there is a new one being produced on. Uh, we don't know what the compromise between the governor and the, the, the Congress is going to look like. Um, again, we're we watching. We, 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 we checking uh, with, with PMA, with EdRed, and so hopefully we will have a full picture for you uh, next month when we uh, adopting but the... the just keeping that for a second, the, the, the scenarios we have on the potential of a property tax freeze does have a significant impact on us yes. um, if, it, if it plays itself out. And again, from what we've heard today, um, there, the, the uncertainties with Springfield, it doesn't look as though given where they're going, if they know where they're going, um, District 65 will lose any resources. If the state moves forward and has more resources, we probably won't gain resources. Uh, but that's, that's today's report. We don't know what tomorrow says. That's fit the, the, um, so the Senate overrode. The House will be coming back Wednesday. Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And so I think we'll, you know, know, we'll know more than find that. something out after that. Yeah. Yeah. It, right now, it looks like it's unlikely to get an override. Uh, to have correct, but um, we'll we'll stay tuned and we'll keep you updated. Um, but so the impact of that basically is, and I had asked, I had spoken to Daniel this this morning, and um, is we will not receive any state funding until until it's figured it's out. So if there's you know if there's not an override and they go back into negotiations and revamp SB one. Until they get to some agreement, there will be no additional state payments to our general state aid. Potentially, we could get categorical, but we actually got two million dollars today. Well, go cash it. Will you cash it, please? Yeah. I'm, I'm just saying going here. forward for what we budget. <laughs> yes. So yeah. the four and a half million of general state aid that's in this budget that we are expecting for this fiscal year um, is uncertain at this point. Right. Although, yes. but yeah. until so, yeah, so funding. Uh, a funding appropriation approved by the legislature, there could be no disbursement for current year. Correct. Nope. Yeah. But again, let me stress, as we have publicly, uh, schools will open on time. Yes. And uh, we will absolutely welcome all of our families and all of our kids. 
um, on the 28th of August. That said, the uncertainties that we face as a board and as an administration as we move forward will be nothing but transparent and we will know more as this unfolds, but school will open on time. And I just want to add that we are being very cautious and we actually changed some of our assumptions related to the state revenues for next year. Um, after exchanging emails with Deb Vespa from the state, um, they don't think we will be, uh, they will be able to pay all these late payments. So FY18 budget includes only four payments, not six. Um, again, never happened before, but we are just being cautious um, and we are not including all of the payments that, I, that they owe us in the budget. Any questions? I thought we were, I thought we were just missing one payment. No, we were missing uh, two payments. Uh, then the third payment, um, um, uh, the second payment came. So last year we received only three payments, which is 75% of our allocation. So we still, we still missing a couple payments. I think what may be a bit confusing is the fact that the state is playing a shell game. Mm -hmm. So we have four quarters when we expect payment in a fiscal year. It's been a while since we've gotten all four payments in all four quarters in the fiscal year. So they, even though they made four payments, it was part of it was from prior year. So thank you for that. Let's open it up to questions. Um, and just knowing this is for our review here and then we will be going, taking the budget to the, obviously to the full board meeting based on the timeline that's in the presentation. Thank you, Kathy. Questions? So good, it was so well presented. That May I make a comment? I just wanna uh, thank Kathy and Raphael. Uh, uh, but Kathy, again, as we prepared the budget book, um, this, this presentation of the book has changed dramatically over the last three years. And what we've actually tried to do, and we'll take your crit critique, of course, is to um, articulate the budget issues um, in a clear and transparent way, but also do it by program area. And so there are program pages that are in here um, that will give you some sense of, of how spending occurs in the district. And again, that's new, that's to Kathy's credit, Raphael came in and tweaked a little bit, but worked together really well as a team um, as we take what can be complicated information that sometimes is reported in convoluted ways and make it easier to at least comprehend. So thank you for that. And I've been here a few years and I will say this was the most concise and mm -hmm. easy to digest presentation of the budget thus far, it keeps getting better, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, I have a couple questions, but I want to start with you guys. Go ahead. Um, I just have a couple of really small questions. This is all very clearly laid out, so thank you again. I'll be the echo in the chamber. Um, my questions are actually about the park school budget, and I wanted to understand, um, I guess, the, the joint agreement that we have with District 202, how do we determine what percent we pay, and what percent 202 pays? Um, actually, that was determined in agreement, I think, in 1984. And that was how it was identified at that time. Um, we have examined it. We had a long-range advisory uh, group that met for a few years, and we talked about adjusting that but kind of what happened is our students increased over their students at that point in time. So we didn't go further in terms of that adjustment. But it was a long time ago that that was decided. We own the building. Um, that's part of it. But it's our property. Okay. And we technically employ the staff, although under the shared agreement, the high school pays, District 202 pays those resources. Do okay. we currently have more, because I, I have a related question Good to question. that, do we, is there a roughly a 60-40 split in terms of the, what would be the home district of the students? Yeah, I think now there is, but a few mm -hmm. years back, I think it was reversed, and okay. we were still right. paying 60, but now yeah, it's, it's back to that percentage, yes. Um, 
That was my first question. Let me take a few more minutes to get a few more, but someone else can go ahead with more questions. I have a question. It's, um, it's more of a technical question that I want to understand. You were mentioning that the CPI is generated based on economic factors that are two years prior mm -hmm. than the actual fiscal year that they're impacting. So, but then there was also mentioned that right after the election, the CPI was shifting, and so I was just trying to get the precise calculation of how this. If I can clarify that, what the CPI does, it looks at all the 20 major urban areas, and it looks at buckets of things like food, utilities, housing, for the prior month. Okay. And what it does, is they do the Bureau of Labor Statistics do a calculation to determine what the average cost and increase in those uh, items are. Mm -hmm. That's how you roughly get the CPI. I think what you were referring to was the using of the CPI to calculate the levy. It's always behind. But the actual CPI, the index itself, is always a month behind. So for example, the data that we have right now, I think the latest one is from June. June. Right. So June is the latest one that is 1 1.6. Mm -hmm. It always comes out the third Monday after the prior month. Okay. So I think that's the confusion. The one that we were talking, that you were talking about, it's always behind two years, is the because end of the year it. CPI. So for example, we are getting ready, we'll be getting ready to do the 2017 levy in November to be filed in December. The data to be used for that is actually going to be 2016. CPI last month, uh, which will be December CPI of 2016 is what is going to be used for the 2017 tax levy. Okay. So, so that's a year behind. So the 2017 tax levy that's done in the fall will be based on the 2016 fall CPI? December. December. December, December. CPI. Right. Okay. 26, and it'll affect the 2018 right. 19 year. That's the right. Year. So we're, that's why it ends up yep. being the two right. year lag. So we had the first half in the, uh, in the spring of the current fiscal year, mm -hmm. and then we'll get the second half in the fall of the following fiscal year. So it gets a little confused. So that's the two-year lag. Right. And then when the CPI bounces around, the December date, the December CPI is what's, de what's determinative of what we use for increased revenues. Yes. Thank you. That's a good question. Any other one? Not right now. Okay. <laughs> I have a couple that I didn't think I had. So one is just a, big que a bigger question, which is around property tax appeals. Given the triennial assessment and that we will likely have a lot more appeals than is typical because of the triennial assessment and people are being encouraged to appeal, how will that factor into um, into our revenues? Because I know sometimes when we get more than expected appeals, it increases our, so how are we factoring, is there any factoring, I guess, of the triennial assessment and increased, potentially, tax appeals? So we do budget for, um, for appeals, and uh, it comes out from, unfortunately, from the current uh, revenue stream. Um, I, I didn't specifically, I don't, I'm not sure if we, we included specifically, um, the triannual assessment. I think I'm not even sure if that's it's going to affect. Historically, historically, it's going to be yeah. It will be a credit against yeah. next year's receipt. But historically, during the triannual uh, appeal, you don't get any more refund than you do on the regular appeal okay. because the data that is used is pretty is pretty decent from the treasurer uh, from the uh, county assessor. Is based on actual uh, closing figure for houses based on different neighborhood. So it's not going to be what it wouldn't be any higher than what we get in a regular. We won't be appealing it this year. I think it, if anything, it's going to come in. Uh, will be for refunds yeah. next year. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. So it's just something to yeah. think about because I know you know we are. In, I mean, the district, the county is encouraging folks to appeal. And we actually we check that data and then we, we look at the appeals monthly and see how it's coming and then we, we, we will adjust um, the next year's budget receipts. Okay. And then I just have one other question which is um, as we're thinking, as we're working towards and working on the priority based budgeting which I think is great, 
you know, we've had discussions, we'd, a lot of discussions um, about the use of an equity assessment mm -hmm. tool or lens, and um, I think we should be thinking about how we embed that into our process and, and as we're looking at a new process to ensure and to start making more transparent those decisions that we are making financially um, that correspond with our values and how might we be able to not only embed that in our process but also communicate it um, more effectively. We started to, we've started to do that in last year but I think that's this would be a great idea. opportunity to do that. So that's just more Excellent idea. looking forward request. Lindsay, do you now, or anybody now have questions? No? I like no? the last one of yours. Sorry? I like your last question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Well, Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank you. And welcome aboard. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Kat. Um, okay. So, our next meeting is sept Oh, do we have anyone from, I'm sorry, I didn't even ask. Any comments from the public? Um, our next meeting is September 11th, 2017 at the Finance Committee. Uh, we're going to adjourn at 8.40 p.m. and uh, on whatever today is, August 14th. So we have to go into working work. <laughs> So I move that the Board of Education approve tonight's meeting agenda as presented. Second. Ms. Cohen? Yes. Mr. Falcon? Yes. Ms. Chow? Yes. Ms. Cunningham? Yes. Mr. Hernandez? Yes. Um, do we have names? Okay. Great. Um, so we just have a uh, May I ask a quick question? Is it appropriate for me to make a comment, or do we need it as an agenda item? I think so. Would you mind if I make a com one comment? Just I, I wanted to um, take a minute. Uh, today we had a wonderful experience of bringing uh, all of our principals and assistant principals together on the opening institute day for our principals, and um, uh, indeed, Andalip, uh, Joyce, uh, Rafael, and I were there. Um, deeply engaged. We had a, um, almost a full day conversation about equity and about our hopes and aspirations and fears and challenges that we have going forward. It was, a, um, it, it was the uh, ongoing conversation about equity issues. I'd be remiss though, and I really just wanted to say this, so I appreciate this. Um, the conversation went to Charlottesville and it went to um, the uh, engagement that we have as educators here in Evanston and Skokie to provide a world-class education for all of our kids so that they can live in civil society. And what I would really am quoting our colleagues who are our administrators today, um, the, uh, the engagement in Charlottesville over the weekend, the past weekend, um, was not the example of civil society that we care about here in District 65. And so, or that, let me speak using my equity training that I care about in uh, District 65. So I just wanted to make that as a statement, applaud my administrative colleagues who took a, a really brave stand in talking to each other today. And I wanna quote the uh, poster that's on my wall, that's in many of our lawns, that hate has no home here. And we will continue that throughout the school year. We will continue that in the work that we do. Um, and again, I just uh, thank you for indulging me. I think it was just a, it was a special moment this afternoon given the weekend's events and we will stand tall um, to do everything we can uh, to make a difference in the lives of our children in a way that represents the best of civil society. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we just have one action item on our working board agenda. 
I move that the Board of Education ratify the Board of Education's June 12, 2017 action to approve and authorize the superintendent to sign property schedule number seven to the master tax exempt lease purchase agreement dated June 1, 2012 and all related documents with American Capital Financial Services Incorporated for the financing of the school district's lease of technology equipment in an amount not to exceed $2,100,000. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 This item does not require any discussion, I don't believe, right? This is an action item, so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thank you, Paul, for your comments. I. I wish I, I personally could also speak about Charlottesville. I think that I feel very personally affected by it. At this moment, I, I think that it's a powerful stance for us as a district to, um, to make a comment um, in, in what we believe and um, to ensure that everyone knows that our district is a, a welcoming place. Um, but I think for, for me personally, this is a sad time. Um, so thank you and thank you all for your work, your brave work today. And, um, the impact that it's going to have for the future is um, important, as we saw this weekend. Yeah. Um, with no further business um, to come before the board, I find this meeting adjourned at uh, 8.45.